In today's kind of artist tip segment, I'm going to be interviewing the chief executive troublemaker, Wendy Day. And uh, Wendy Day has been in the music business for about 30 years, and she is such an MVP, and there's so many great resources. She has a book, how to get a record deal. I mean, she's known for all kinds of insane deals that she's done, including cash money for like, you know, a cool 30 million. Um, so this is who we're going to be talking to. I'm going to bring her in right now. Hi. Hi. <laughs> how are you? Oh, doing great. I appreciate your time being here. So, and, uh, you know, oh, understanding you you're, you're very busy. So we're going to jump right into this. So one thing I just want to, um, I guess, clarify or talk about is that you started rap coalition, which is a nonprofit organization. And from what I understand, you kind of did that. So you could help artists and rappers get out of bad yeah, deals. Exactly. Um, I started it in 1992 because I got tired of hearing the stories about my favorite artists getting unfairly taken advantage of. So that was really what started me in the industry. So now let me ask you this, have you gotten a bad rap at any points for being the rap coalition and you're the person that's gonna go after the labels to deal with these bad deals? Has it in impacted you in any way? If, if it has, I don't know. Um, nobody's ever really said it to my face. Oh. <laughs> I made the major labels a lot of money, especially Universal. So I, I can't imagine they would be upset. It's, it's not like I'm going in and pulling Drake and Ed Sheeran off of labels. I'm pulling artists that aren't really doing very well off of labels because labels treat their stars well. It's the artists that aren't doing as well that are kind of in oppressive deals. So yeah. if they and do I, say bad stuff, I don't hear it. Yeah, well, and I think obviously your work speaks for itself. I think that you can be someone who advocates strongly for who you're representing, you know, but at the end of the day, we shake hands and we're done with it, right? If we're professionals. Yeah. So, yeah. so then on the flip side, right? So you have power moves, which uh, my understanding is that's the mm -hmm. for-profit side. Correct. So now, I'm going to hire you. Now, do you have a minimum? Does it take me $250,000 to hire you to represent me? What, is it, what does that look it like? It does. Um, it, that's the all-in budget. It takes $150,000 for me to be able to break an artist to the point where they're starting to make money. And then our company charges a $100,000 fee for doing that. So it's really a quarter million dollars all-in. Obviously, it's not for everybody. We work with artists that have investors and we work with artists that already have careers and want to start their own labels. Um, but artists that don't have money, we really can't help them, not because we don't want to, because we're just not able to. And that's why I give away so much free information about what we do, because I feel like just because you don't have money doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to grow a career. 100%. Okay, so let's talk about that. It takes, let's say, 150000 if you aren't hiring Wendy Day, the professional, but if you're doing it by yourself as an independent artist, that $150,000, what does that go to? Or what should it go to? It should go to all types of marketing and promotion. Um, it should go to shooting videos. Most of it should go to content. Content is so important today. We test songs before we put them out. So part of that budget on our side when we're working for artists goes to testing music. It goes to influencer marketing, digital marketing, social media marketing, promotional tours. If the artist has the ability to go to radio, we'll go to radio with the artist. Of course, we do that last. And that's okay. only if the artist has a radio song and that's their market. But basically what we do is we help artists find their market and target those folks, find as many potential fans for them as possible and turn them into rabid fans. And we've been doing that for almost 30 years now. So as far as testing content, you were talking about that. So, um, you know, something that I think I learned, you know, early in my, in my career in marketing just for myself, which didn't happen so many late, you know, years into my career, but learning Facebook ads, right? So anyone can do it, right? Even on yeah. YouTube, it's free. 
But it doesn't mean if you go and get an investor with $100,000, you're just going to dump it into ads. You're saying, hey, no. so let's actually test and figure out what content works. Yes. Yes. I'm talking about songs and content. Let's test five songs and we'll still put out all five songs, but let's test them and see which ones are going to do the best. So song two and four might get the best reaction. So I'm going to put 60% of a budget behind those two songs and then 40% of the budget behind the remaining three. Now, I don't know if you've experienced this, but in recent months, and I would say over the last year, um, I personally had issues with Facebook when I'm running the ads and pulling traffic off Facebook to Spotify. So what's your workaround? What do you recommend for artists? We don't, we don't, we don't drive artists to Spotify. We test with videos on Facebook and we test okay. the community at Facebook. We target, the community that's going to react to the artist directly. In the past, we have done Google ads. They don't work as well as Facebook and Instagram ads. That's really our focus. But then in fairness, we work with mostly rap artists. That's kind of our lane. One, and I don't know if you agree with this, but one marketing person had said to me, the um, workaround is you want to drive people to go and search on YouTube, right? So don't have it go to YouTube. Don't have it go to Spotify. If they like the content, them putting in the algorithm and searching your name is going to help you as far as generating traffic and search results. And so that's a very positive net thing that comes out of Facebook ads, for example. A absolutely. But we don't do that in terms of testing. I'm, I'm talking about testing the music at first, but when okay. we do run Facebook ads, to drive fans to the artist. Yes, we'll do that. We'll do swipe ups. We'll do a bunch of different things. We do, we do, we test a lot of stuff. We keep what works. We get rid of what doesn't. And our motto is to fail faster. So we want to know what's working as quickly as possible. And then we just do more of that. Love it. All right. So you've said you got to give up a lot to win in this industry. What do independent artists need to give up or be ready to give up in order to be successful in the music business? I, I almost want to say everything, but that sounds a little bit <laughs> negative. So you've got to be willing to outwork everybody. You've got to be willing to put in the time and the effort to really stand out. Like, to be really honest with you, making music is a full time job. Promoting music is a full-time job. Social media is a full-time job. Performing is a full-time job. So when you're an artist, you have multiple jobs and you've got to be as great as you possibly can at each one. So you've got to have really great music. You've got to have an amazing work ethic. You've got to really be able to stand out from everybody else. You've got to be able to outwork everybody else. And you also need to have a budget. Sadly, this is not a free industry. And what's your answer when an artist says, okay, well, I don't have a marketing person. I don't have a booking agent. What's your answer to them? Well, if you don't find somebody to do that job, you're going to have to do that job yourself. And it is possible. You're just going to have to learn it as quickly as possible and be as good as you possibly can. But I just feel like if you're really talented and you've got a team of people around you, Find people that can help you that are good at possibly that job and have them learn how to do that. If you've got somebody that's really tech savvy, why not have them learn how to run ads and help you? Yeah. And that's, you know, this whole idea that if I could just get signed to a record label, they'll make me a big star because they know how to do things. And my question is, why can't you learn how to do those things? Why can't you be your own label? And so that's my challenge to independent artists because I'm, you know, I think you and I are on the same page. I advocate very much for staying independent, doing it yes. yourself. And then yes. strategically, if it makes sense to do a deal with a label at some point, great. Don't sign well, too early. When you have leverage. Yeah. When you have leverage. Yes. Yes. Yep. A, a basic deal when you're a brand new artist really sucks. And you're going right. to sit at that <laughs> label and end up doing the work yourself anyway, because they're not going to have incentive to really get behind you when you're brand new. So even if you sign to a label, you're going to really be doing the work that you would be doing if you were independent. So you might as well stay independent, keep 100% of the ownership until you're in a leveraged position where you can really negotiate a financially lucrative deal. Yeah.
Yeah, and I, you know, I also just say, if you're looking for someone to do it for you, whether it's a record label or you hire someone, right? Because lots of people say, right. pay me $5,000, I'll do this thing for you. When you're done with that, when you're done with the relationship with the record label, you still don't know shit. You're back to ground zero. So exactly. you should be learning. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And if you learn how it works, not only can you utilize that for yourself, but at some point you can sign other artists and become effective in helping them grow their careers and you can make money together. 100%. Okay, so then let's talk about where the value is in being an artist, right? So we know the traditional record label deal, you sign, the label owns your masters. When it comes to publishing, I know you uh, have said, try to keep your publishing, you know, 100% if possible. Explain why that matters. Because when you have ownership, first of all, you're gonna make the lion's share of the money, but you also have control over the music. So if you're somebody that doesn't want your music to appear in a condom commercial, for example, you have the control over that because you own the publishing, you own the rights to be able to say, no, I don't want my music to, you know, to appear in that movie or on that TV show, or um, I don't want to promote alcohol or, you know, whatever, whatever your belief system is, you have more control over your music. You know, Justin Timberlake just did a deal with Hypnosis and they purchased his publishing rights for $100 million. So yeah. there's also a potential big payday if you hold on to yes. those rights. Yes. Yep. So uh, Ryan right now on... they're selling, it's selling like around 20 times value, isn't it? Yeah, so I, I, I did a little, I stock in on Hypnosis and how they do it. So they're like, our typical uh, multiple is 12 to 14, but okay. we'll go up to 22. We will go up to 22 for the bigger artists. Amazing. So. Yeah, no, very interesting. Um, so Ryan on YouTube, he had a question. He goes, or I guess a statement. I have friends in the music industry got they got screwed. They mostly got written off as a write-off for the company. And also their identity had to start over. So on the identity part, how often do you see labels trying to take the trademark ownership of the artist's name, the band name? Uh, do you I, see that very often? I don't anymore. Um, in no. the early days of hip hop, I saw that all the time. Um, I know Akon does not own his name, but other than him, I can't think of another example of an artist that doesn't have ownership of their own name, their own trademark. But I do yeah. know that, that it happens. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely see that uh, very rarely these days. Yeah. Okay, so you use this beautiful analogy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just destroy it, but I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to do it. So you said you, and, that, and put basically the record label as a cruise ship. You said the record label is like a cruise ship. You're going along slowly, but it's big and beautiful and robust and all this. But the independent artist is like having a jet ski, right? So there are two different things and aspects of going at this. And I say, I'm not here to villainize record labels. I do deals with the majors every day but I advocate for independence. So for, for you, what's the difference? Why, why is it okay to sign with a record label? Um, because there are some instances where they can be really helpful. Like what if you're an artist who has zero entrepreneurial skills and you really need a label to, to get you out there? Or what if you're an artist that makes incredible radio records, but you can't find an investor? And we know that to take a song at Urban Radio to number one, you're going to spend anywhere from $125,000 to $150,000 for one song. So if you don't have an investor, but you're making radio music, you're probably going to need a major label. So they're not, they're not evil and terrible, and you should never do business with them. They have a point. They have a reason. It's just... If you're going to do a deal with one, you should really build leverage so that you're doing some sort of a joint venture with them as opposed to signing to the typical standard 12 to 15 percent artist deal, which just Absolutely. Sucks. with with now what we don't call a 360, but the ancillary rights to collect revenues. And so I know you had said um, in an interview, you were talking about how you just stopped doing deals for a long time because you yeah. were really pissed about the 360. So explain for those this. for those who don't know, what's a 360 deal? Um, a 360 deal is when labels started to lose money because of, of um, MP3s. And in order to make more revenue, they started to take bigger pieces of the pie from recording artists. 
So in a deal, they would take a percentage of ancillary income, which would be the show income. Um, if the artists were to get um, a movie deal or book rights, they would want to take a percentage of that. My complaint was that they weren't helping them land those types of deals. They were just taking a percentage of something that they had nothing to do with. And of course, the labels argued, well, we're putting money into building the artist to be a star. We should share in all aspects. But the artist makes the smallest piece of the, the pie to begin with, and they're the last to get paid. So I have a tremendous issue with somebody trying to eat off of an artist when they're not even putting in work to get them those ancillary types of deals. So having represented, you know, and worked with labels yourself, right, on behalf of the artist or otherwise, do you at least uh, contend, understand from the viewpoint now and understanding that the money doesn't really come in from the streaming, right? The big money right. comes in from the tours and the merchandise. Exactly. So, exactly. So what's your position now? Um, with the artists that come to us, they have to do ancillary deals with their investors in order to for the money to come in strongly enough for the investor to recoup their investment. So I definitely see splits, but as soon as the money starts coming in, in a large way, the deal needs to be renegotiated so that the artist gets a larger share of the income. They can't always be the one to take the short. Money does not have more value than the art form. Love that. Okay, so let's talk really fast about the investment deals. So when you do the investor deals, um, are you setting up maybe new LLCs, you know, for this particular yes. venture and they're becoming yes. members? Is that kind of what you're doing? Yes. Well, it depends on the deal. I mean, there's some there's some investors that only want a portion of the first release or the first year or the first two years. And then there are investors at the other extreme that want 50% of the artist in perpetuity. Well, not in perpetuity, but you know, for a long period of time, however long right. that is, five years, seven years, whatever. So it, you don't necessarily get what's fair, you get what you negotiate. And it also depends on how much leverage you have. If you're an artist that's able to stream a lot and you're getting paid shows very early and you're going viral on TikTok all the time, it's going to be much easier to find an investor than if nobody's heard of you and you put out music and you get 12 streams or, you know, 12 views or, you know, 12 of anything. Right. So for the artist rappers watching this right now, a question might be, okay, I'd love an investor. How do I get an investor? And what do you, I guess, tell your clients or what do they do? Well, when people come to me, they've already got investors in place but it's probably that that and how do I get a record deal are the two most popular questions that I'm asked. Mm -hmm. And my advice for finding an investor is put out your music, but also put out a business plan. Tell everybody in your circle that you're looking for an investor. You can't be silent and find somebody. It's not going to work. So you, you can start going to Chamber of Commerce meetings. You can join the Rotary Club. You can go places where there are people that have money hang out and let people see your movement. Let them see your devotion and how hard you're working because people invest in things where they know they're going to make a return on that investment. If they think that they're going to give you money and they're never going to get it back, it's going to be really hard to find an investor. Oh, and I love that you just, you're like rotary. Uh, what is it? Um, not Kiwanis. Chamber of it Commerce. Kiwanis. You, yeah, anywhere so any of these... where people that have money go to hang out. And of course yeah. the biggest one, the place where, most of my clients find money is by telling everybody in their world that they're looking for an investor. And yeah. inevitably, somebody will be somewhere and someone will say to them, hey, I'm starting a record label or I'm looking for an artist to invest in. And that person goes, wait, I know somebody. Who was it that just said to me, you know, that they're looking for an investor? Oh, yeah, it was, you know, little Jojo down the block. That's really the best way to find money is through your network because when people know you and love you, they usually trust you. And when there's a level of trust, it makes it very easy for people to match make. 
Yeah, and I found too that people outside the entertainment industry, the investors, sometimes just want to get in because of the novelty, the excitement. Yeah, they they want the backstage. Yes. They want to be on the music video sets, and that's all they care about. They're like, okay, here's a quick 50. I don't care. Just invite I'd me. I'd rather have that. I'd rather have somebody from outside of music because somebody in music is going to want 50% of everything and their idea of recouping is based on a, a very old archaic model somebody outside of music is probably going to do a little bit of a better deal with an artist especially if they have a vc background hmm. yes vc being a uh, venture capital venture capitalists yeah. So Brian on um, YouTube, I read that lots of signed artists are complaining because they have to keep their social media feeds fresh themselves. So I agree. Can you do it for yourself? So let me, we, we covered okay. recently, Halsey was very upset because the label was withholding her song until she had a viral moment on right. TikTok. Which made her go viral. <laughs> well, well, no, and that's exactly what I thought. I'm like, all right, there it goes. All right, she's getting all the press now. <laughs> exactly. And, and then, then there was the release of the song a week later. Now, when you're yes. talking and having the hard conversation with your artists who don't want to do social media, what do you say? Well, two things. Um, we have a firm that we can hire for someone that has a budget to pay somebody for social media, but it's the most basic and simplest thing that you can do for yourself. Yes, it's very much a full-time job because it's a lot of work to stay on top of your social media, but nobody can interact with your fans the way that you can. And certainly in filming content, you've got to do it yourself. It's you. I can't film content for you. Only you can film content. I can film you making content, but I can't film me making content for you. So you're going to have to, at some point, accept the fact, I call it living out loud. You're going to have to accept the fact that you're going to have to go live on your social media. You're going to have to explain your lifestyle. You're going to have to talk about why you made songs. People want to know who the artist is. And if people get to know you and feel a connection, they will really love you and they will really cut for you. And that's what you want. You want rabid fans. They want to know where you're from. How did you grow up? What kind of student were you? What were you thinking when you made this song? How do you choose your tracks? They really want to be part of the process. So why not live out loud on your social media and let them see the process? Let them see who you really are. Be authentic. Yeah. And take, I guess, your feelings out of the equation. That's something I had to do because it's hard. You know, as as part of my life, right? So I am an independent artist myself, but I'm also a lawyer and I don't, I didn't like talking about being an attorney, but as soon as I finally right. took my feelings out of it, I'm like, maybe this is entertaining. Maybe people it can is. just get to know me. All of a sudden yes. I grew by like 50,000 followers in two months, you know, so right. there's value in just putting there, yourself there out is there. There's value. And, and, and I acknowledge that it's hard because most people aren't this open. Most people don't want to, you know, talk about themselves ad nauseum, but you really have to. It's it's like making a friend. If you don't talk to people and let them in and be a little vulnerable and show them who you are, you're not going to make friends like in real life. And social media is basically an offshoot of that. It's like you're making friends through a screen. And you've got to be you and you've got to let people in and you've got to let them see who you are as hard as that is. And I know it's and you, hard. And you never know what's going to hit someone in the right place. So meaning just because something Correct. isn't like a viral piece of content, something might go deep for someone because you shared a story. Absolutely. Right? So it only reached two, 200 people, but 100 of those people are like diehard fans now. Exactly. Exactly. And that's where you make the money. You make money from the people that rock with you. The ones that will come to your shows and buy your merchandise the ones that will share you with their fr with their friends and sort of be your cheerleader and and talk about you to groups of people and say wow i really love this artist and here's why you know you need that so i get a lot of calls when it comes to crystal i need to get out of my record label contract right i want to terminate big call not just for record label deals right so management contracts you name it they want to get out so yes. I'm sure you get those calls. Talk to me about that. What do you do when you get the call? You know, it, it, and it really depends on, on who they're signed to and what they've signed. It's so much easier 
to be proactive and stop someone from signing a bad deal than it is to break a deal. Because breaking a deal is like a divorce. It's very difficult. It drains your energy and no one wins. You don't win. The label doesn't win. No one wins. So I'd rather prevent somebody from getting into a messed up deal than break a contract. But if I have to do it, if they're signed to, you know, Joe Bag of Donuts records down the street where I can't get somebody to take my call, I'm never going to be able to break that deal. But if they're signed to a major label, then it becomes more of a negotiation as to, you know, this person's not happy. You're not happy with them. They're not making any money. You're not making any money. Rather than have these terrible, bad feelings all the way around, let's figure out what makes sense for you to let them go. And normally labels understand that. If you're Drake or Rihanna or Ed Sheeran and you just want to leave and you don't have a reason, they're not going to let you go because you're too profitable. But if you're an artist that's really disgruntled and you're not making money, they're not making money, and you're just on your social media bitching and moaning about the label, there's incentive for them to get rid of you because they just don't want that negative energy. Nobody does. It's toxic. Snow, the product, um, she was signed with a major and then they ended up letting her go. Okay, so she, she said this in an interview. She's like, yeah, let's try it and we'll see how it goes. And then came back together. The record didn't take off. And so they let her just voluntarily out of the contract, which for me is unheard that's of. That's surprising. Right. Yeah, that's surprising. So, and then she went, and this is why labels don't let you out the contract, because she went and released something else and she blew up. So they lost their investment. So which is why I more commonly see the artists just get shelved. The yeah. label's like, I don't know what to do with you now. Maybe you'll have a TikTok viral moment and we'll circle back with you in a year. I would I would rather the label take a percentage going forward than to just shelve somebody. Because if you're shelved, you have no budget, you have no energy, you have no motivation. At least if they let you go and say, okay, you can go, but we want 10% or 5% or whatever percent of the money that you make going forward, that just seems to be, that seems to make more sense. It seems more fair to me somehow. I don't love so, it, but. Yeah, I mean, look, the way I kind of go, go through, I'm like, what? let's look at the contract. Have there been material breaches? Can we make some kind of claim to terminate it? If not, you know, kind of my last Hail Mary, other than, hey, can we negotiate a buyout of some kind? The artist usually doesn't have money to pay it, even if there was a number. Correct. But the last Hail Mary is always just something simple. Like, you know, if it's like a mid-tier or a small label, have they complied with formalities? Like, actually forming their company, right? Because from a legal standpoint, if they're like, I signed it as the LLC and they're not a real company, we technically have an argument to void the contract and say, it wasn't a real one to begin with, because you lied. <laughs> So, but it's very tricky. And so I totally agree with what you it's said. It's difficult, yeah. You want to negotiate it up front and have the protection. So let's talk about entertainment attorneys. Do you need them? Oh God, yes. You know, I, I, I've been doing this for 30 years. I've done some amazing deals and I don't do it without an attorney. You absolutely need an attorney, not just for what's in the contract, but sometimes for what's missing. What's missing can actually hurt you more than what's there. Yeah, Absolutely uh, uh, you need. And it has to be an entertainment attorney. It can't be a real estate attorney. It can't be your cousin Bob, you know, who's a criminal attorney or a corporate attorney. It has to be an entertainment attorney because this is so nuanced and unique and different from every other industry out there that you absolutely need somebody that specializes in this. Yeah, and even once you find an entertainment attorney, you still need to make sure it's a good foot, right? Is there rapport between you? Are you having good yes. communication? But then is that attorney on the ground floor doing it, right? Because I've also met entertainment attorneys who did it 30 years ago and they're not really practicing anymore. So they don't know the changes Correct. in the industry. They don't understand social Correct. media. So you can still get into trouble even with an entertainment attorney. A agreed. And then there's entertainment attorneys that really just want the fee and they don't care if the deal is right for the artist or not. They're just going to close the deal because they want their, you know, financial remuneration from the deal. So you've yeah. really, you, you do have to be very careful. There has to be a level of trust and you need a reputable entertainment attorney. You know, the labels out here all know who the scumbags are 
And if you're rent- if you're represented by a scumbag, you're probably going to get a shitty deal. I think it was Migos suing um, because they got the attorney that was recommended by the label, found out way mm-hmm. later, you know, out of their shitty record label deal uh, mm-hmm. that it was the label's attorney as well. Right? Absolutely. So we I'd say 90% kind of-, of the deals that I've broken in this industry, that is the situation. The artist signs to a label. They don't get their own attorney. They take the advice of the attorney that is representing the other side and they just sign because they want the signing bonus or they want the advance or, you know, they're not thinking about what's at stake or they trust the label because, you know, they're, 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 they feel like a family. Yeah, no, never a better investment than getting an attorney. And guys, you know, as an entertainment attorney myself, right, in my own career, I represent myself most of the time on most things. On big deals, I am still getting a separate counsel. I'm getting separate eyes. So it's, it's, you know, and you, you've been in the industry. I know you know these contracts. I know you can read this like an attorney. If I can can break a contract, I can certainly write a contract, but I never would. I'm smart enough to let smarter people than me do the heavy lifting. <laughs> so uh, Brian on LinkedIn, he had a question just as far as um, Wendy. So do you do you call yourself a consultant? Um, yes. I know you're not obvious. Okay, got it. Yeah, I'm not an attorney. Yes, not not an attorney. Um, but as far as you know, artist manager, consultant no. slash many. Yes. Okay. okay, got it. Yeah, I, I I don't enjoy managing. It's it's a thankless job. It's for me. It was babysitting. <laughs> so I stopped doing it as quickly as I could. Now, someone had um, a good question. Let me just see if I can find it really fast. So they were asking as far as in your experience. Let me go. Let me go. So Miss Winston, this is from, or yeah, Winston. Miss Day, what was your most memorable deal when you you were a part of and what was the worst experience? Um, I'm, I'm assuming you're asking me the two opposites that it's yes. not the worst experience of, of my most memorable deal. Um, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, that's a tough one. That's a toss up between Eminem and Cash Money. I'm going to pick Cash Money. So Cash Money was memorable because it was just a deal that didn't make sense. And the whole time we were negotiating it and they were giving us more and more and more because we were asking for more and more and more. The whole time I'm like, okay, I'm asking for more and they're giving it to me. This doesn't make sense. And it taught me that market share really matters to the major labels. And that was one of the reasons that they did the cash money deals because cash money was dropping music so quickly and so often that Universal wanted that for the pipeline, that the value of the market share meant more to them than the talent of the artist. Not to say they weren't talented because they are, were. Um, That was probably my most memorable deal, Um, my most disappointing deal. Probably I'd have to say it was Trick Trick at Motown. He was a friend of Eminem. Eminem called me and asked me to negotiate Trick Trick's deal there. Not there, but negotiate his deal. I agreed to do it. Um, Sylvia Roan was the head of Motown at the time. She wanted to be in the Eminem game, but Eminem was signed to another label and Trick Trick and M were just friends. So it wasn't like... M could appear on every song that Trick Trick put out. Um, She got behind the first song, which featured Eminem, and then lost interest after that. And that was really disappointing. Um, I've probably done somewhere around 20 deals in my career. Only two of them haven't worked, and both of them were with the same person that we chose to sign with. And that's just really disappointing. I understand. Um, on the Motown, it's funny. My for whatever reason lately, my office keeps getting fake Motown contracts from artists who are like, Motown wants to sign me, and it's like one and a half pages of someone pretending to be. Isn't the that label. crazy? Like how many scams there are out here, and it's amazing to me that with all the information out here, people still fall for it. It'll be like Motown A and R three hundred four at gmail dot com, and oh, here Motown wants to sign me. It's like uh. No, <laughs> no. And I'm like, look, at this point, I'm not your attorney. You're just calling my office. But I can tell you, it looks a little suspect. If you want to pay me, you can. But I don't want to waste your time or money. This doesn't look exactly. Like this. <laughs> exactly. All right. So let's do um, two more questions. I'm going to let you go. Sure. Uh, so so number one, when it comes to artists, you know, let's go back to the beginning. Right. We said you have to do the work. 
You have to give up a lot have to be to. successful yes. in yes. this industry. So when it comes to going to school for yourself as an artist, I know you have resources, you have a book, you guys can go to wendyday.com and that's kind of a hub where you can find yeah. all of her great stuff. Um, you know, but where do you think artists should start? Do they need to start an LLC and get their legal contracts or do they need to learn their marketing first? What's at the top I, of the I, hierarchy? I think they, I think they need to learn how this works because it doesn't make sense to go in and set up an LLC and spend that money if once you do the research, you realize that this isn't for you. I would learn, you know, basketball players don't get on the court without knowing how to play the game. And I think artists really need to do some preliminary research and see if this is for you because it's a business. It's, it's no longer just making music because you love it. I wish it were, but it's not, it's a business. So a lot of the joy is now turned to promotion and marketing instead of, oh my God, I made this song and I love it and I'm just gonna share it with the world. That doesn't exist anymore. So you may move forward and realize, you know what? This isn't what I thought it was. and. I would hate for you to make that realization or have that realization after you've spent a shit ton of money. So I would do a little bit of research first. That research would, will tell you what you need to do and in what order you need to do it. And then pull the trigger and just start moving forward and start working and building your own fan base. Because whether you want a record deal or whether you want to stay independent and make the lion's share of the money yourself, it's the same process. You've got to build a fan base. Labels will not sign an artist that isn't wanted and isn't buzzing a little bit, at least in their region. And I don't mean locally in their, in their state or their city. They want an artist that's buzzing regionally and online. So if you want to be successful at this, it's kind of the same path either way, whether you want to sign or stay independent. No, 100%. And you know, for me, obviously, being the entertainment attorney and just seeing, you know, I'm always on the the other side of it where I see all the problems, right? So often we are right. doing the prevention and building the legal framework and getting the contracts, we're dealing with the problems. And so yeah. I'm kind of at this this place. And that's why I started this channel, right? It's to have a free outlet. But I'm like giving away contracts that are like, in, you know you know how expensive contracts can be when you hire yeah. a law firm, but I'm at a point where I just want artists to have, if you're going to, you know, license a beat, have a license agreement, right? So something simple. And there's, a, I think, an intimidation factor to just having a contract because they're like, you know, what if they don't want to do the contract or I seem difficult? So how often do you advise your clients to be like, no, we absolutely need to get contracts for these collaborations, these features? You need contracts for everything because you can't put music out if you don't have the right. So if you don't have a deal with the producer that allows you to put that song out and make money and promote it, you can't. So you could just throw it out there, but then that person has the right to stop you or to sue you afterwards because you didn't gain the contractual rights to use that beat or that feature or whatever is on your song. 100%. All right, last question. If you were not in, you know, or having a career in the music business wasn't possible, what else would you be doing? Ooh, I don't really know the answer to that. That's a great <laughs> question. I I can't imagine. I am so addicted to this. I can't imagine doing anything else. Um, I love tech, so I guess I'd probably be working in tech. I'd probably start an advocacy organization called Tech coalition and then i'd probably start a for-profit organization called tech moves to keep tech designers independent and selling their <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I don't know making this up as i go right i i can't imagine not doing this like even at my lowest moments where things went horribly wrong there was never a time where i said huh maybe i'll do something else for 30 years, this is all I've ever wanted to do. So I, I, I can't imagine doing anything else. No, it's 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 absolutely a curse. I'm sorry, so that's a shitty answer, but it's true. No, that's a but that goes to just you. 
it's in your nature. And I'd say this, um, you know, as far as just my passion for music, I became an attorney because I wanted to actually go to school for myself to represent myself in my I own career. That. And then and then I was like, you know, I could actually help people. So let's just do this, you know, that's so I awesome. do both. Yeah, but it's, that's so it's amazing. There's nothing more difficult than trying to have a successful music career. Hands down. It, that's yes, just... <laughs> it's it's so much work. But let me let me tell you the flip side of it, that it's worth it. I've seen artists that are regional that are making $50,000 a month just in streaming. I've seen artists become multimillionaires doing this. And I've seen artists change the world doing this. So whatever you're in this for, whether it's just to feed yourself and your family or whether you want to become an international star or whether you just want people to hear your thoughts and your ideas, all of the work is worth it. Just learn how to do it so that you don't lose any money and any energy and time because you have a very short window as an artist to be successful. The older you get, the harder this is, the less fans you're going to reach. 100%. So fail fast. I love it. Wendy, thank you so much for coming on the show, guys. Like I said, go to wendyday.com, uh, her at Rap Coalition on Instagram. Anywhere else you want people to go to follow you? wendyday.com is the best place to start. And there's free videos, a ton of how-to stuff. I've got a podcast called The Cheat Code. There are so many places you can go to get free information. And, you know, I got to tell you, I love that you're doing this. I know you're not really making money doing this. And I just love your commitment to helping people and thank you. Thank you. And I can't wait to have you on the show again, whenever that time is. So we will see you. Happy then. to thank do you, it Wendy. whenever you need me. <laughs> Bye guys. Have a good night. Bye.